auditory media, event theory, literary communities, and affective labor. Uh, she's a member of the federally funded spoken web team uh, who have developed a web-based archive of digitized uh, audio recordings for literary study and the founding editor of the Fred Waugh Digital Archive. Uh, she has done extensive critical and archival work on the sound artists' archives of Japanese-Canadian poet and artist Roy Kyuko with, Ka uh, sorry, um, with Karis Scherer, she is co-editing the collected works of Vancouver writer Maria Hindmarch, uh, forthcoming in 2020 with Talon Books. And then Jason Kamlot's two forthcoming books are Phonopoetics, The Making of Early Literary Recordings, out later this year, and also the collection he has uh, co-edited with Catherine McLeod called Can Lit Across Media, Unarchiving the Literary Event, also out later this year. He is the author of four collections of poetry, um, and tonight he'll be reading from the Animal uh, Library and Attention Old Typewriters. Um, and he is also the principal investigator and director of the Spoken Web Shirk funded partnership that focuses on the history of literary sound recordings and the digital preservation and presentation of collections of literary audio. He is a professor here at Concordia and associate dean in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Um, so at this point, I want to ask Jason to come to the front and just say a few words about Spoken Web, um, after which we're going to launch right into the poetry reading. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? That was an inside joke. Um, <laughs> Um, so thanks everyone for being here. Um, I don't feel I have to say too much about Spoken Web because it was mentioned in every bio that was just read, <laughs> but it is uh, a large um, collaborative project um, across North America, but really involving archives of um, recorded uh, literary events of different kinds, conversations, readings, etc. cetera. Um, and we're working on First of all, preserving those collections, digitizing them, um, developing a metadata schema so we can actually search them and use them and thinking of interesting ways to present them online if we can get the rights to do so. Um, and we're also very interested in um, mobilizing and you know, uh, our thinking about the significance of those collections in different ways. Uh, sound recordings are really interesting to think about uh, and to do literary history with. It's quite different from working on the page alone, right? There are things you hear or you, you have access to from listening to these recordings that you might not in reading a book. You hear a kind of sociality that you might not hear, you know, um, in reading a book necessarily as easily or, you know. Uh, you also obviously have access to different modes of performance, uh, to the sound of uh, communities or groups or scenes that you wouldn't have otherwise. So. Those are some of the kinds of things we're interested in looking at. And we're also interested in not only sort of preserving and making these collections useful for research, but in doing interesting things with them. Um, so uh, trying to bring them out uh, into the world in different ways, uh, in, you know, in part by creating new sound works out of them, um, uh, by having us hear them differently because we remix them or do weird things with them. Um, and also just by having us listen to them uh, in groups in different formats. So the ghost reading series that has been mentioned is one such example. I'm going to just announce that um, the next ghost reading in the series is going to be uh, the listening to a recording of a reading by Andreas Schroeder and Maxine Gad that took place on February the 18th in 1972. And it's going to take place on February the 18th. Um, and it's going to be held in this space as well. And uh, we've been experimenting with, these, uh, with this series um, by listening together. We usually interrupt the reading halfway through and just talk about what we've heard and just sort of get feedback on it. But also, we've been um, giving everyone canvases or other objects to actually and a whole series of markers and paints and things like that. It becomes a bit of an arts and crafts session as well. Um, to engage in sort of jotting down, drawing, doodling, uh, transcribing uh, what they're listening to. So they're kind of, uh, you could think of them as uh, transcription uh, 
uh, canvases, right? Uh, and we've collected a whole bunch of these from the various readings we've done, and they're really quite beautiful. We're thinking we'll eventually do a kind of exhibition of these um, traces of people listening to old readings. Um, so I think Catherine uh, yeah, has, uh, has distributed a little flyer, so we encourage you to come to that. And um, with that said, let the poetry reading begin. <coughs> nothing ever happens at poetry readings. I mean, nothing that makes people happy. Every poetry reading I've ever attended, whether as a listener or a reader, has ended in tears. Torn prom dresses, severed relationships, dehydration, chronic asthma, meat poisoning, misunderstanding, embarrassment, aphasia, stroke, shame in oneself, shame for others, general mortification, rigor mortis, the depletion of fish populations, deforestation, ill will towards others, malevolent gossip, and the loss of a significant other. My reading here will also be somewhat different from a public reading in which uh, I, will, I will be reading louder and reading to a room full of people. Um, sometimes I will sound probably more relaxed here than on other readings. This is one of the poems that Ian Souten said shouldn't be in the book, Grandfather. A lot of these, uh, these poems written at that time in Vancouver <coughs> have to do with, uh, with where I've been, where I am right then, as, I was, as you can imagine, um, being in the first year or two of university, you have to spend a lot of your time there now. And we turned that into a kind of a career in the sex clause. And then we also decided we had to find a, um, another place to study with, and that for me was that turned out to be family. So I have, over the, over the say, five years in the first part of the 60s, I've uh, written a lot of poems about my family. This one's called My Grandfather, it appears in about 155 anthologies. Grandfather. Clothes, for a suit of clothes and 700 ruby meals a year, taking an anabaptist. 
Anabaptist cane across the back every day. Taking an Anabaptist cane across the back every day. Taking an Anabaptist cane across the back every day for four years till he was whipped out of England. Twelve years old and across the ocean alone to apocalyptic Canada. Ontario of bone bending child labor. Six years on the road to Damascus till his eyes were blinded with the blast of Christ and he wandered west. To Brandon among wheat kings and heathen Saturday night. Young red haired Bristol boy shoveling coal in the basement of Brandon College five in the morning. Then built his first wooden church and married a sick girl who bore two live children and died in several pitiful letters and the Manitoba night. He moved west with another wife and built children and churches. Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, British Columbia, holy, Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, holy, Lord God Almighty, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, struck his labored bones with pain and left him a postmaster prodding grandchildren with crutches, another dead wife and a glass bowl of photographs, and holy books unopened save the Bible by the bed, till he died, till the day he died, the day before his 85th birthday, in a Catholic hospital of sheets white as his hair. Poetry readings are events. They are events that involve performances of poetry off the page and out loud for an audience. It's public. But do we have the critical language through which to analyze a poetry reading as an event? When Charles Bernstein argues that readings, quote, rival publishing as the most significant method of distribution for poetic works, end quote. He situates this argument within a call to examine the ways in which the readings as event are documented, or rather, not documented. For Bernstein, quote, this absence of documentation, together with the tendency among critics and scholars to value the written over the performed text, has resulted in a remarkable lack of attention given to the poetry reading as a medium in its own right, a medium that has had a profound impact on the 20th century poetry, and in particular, the poetry of the second half of the century. Is poetry reading one word or two. I often find myself with poetry reading in the mouth, left then with a feeling I should quali qualify poetry to include fiction, nonfiction, genre nonspecific. It only feels like it's everywhere to you because you have poetry on the mind. In a defensive gesture, I reply, but poetry reading is a legitimate qualification. You never talk of a fiction reading or a creative nonfiction reading, these labels just don't exist. They would never roll off your tongue. But true, I concede, I do expand the genre-specific poetry reading to an umbrella term for the general reading. Common knowledge that curation is cool, but spell check doesn't accept it. A word document judges orthography and underscores it in a red, jagged ruling. Hipness rewrites semantics. A clothing retailer sells a brightly colored style of trousers called the curator pant, while the brand called curated promises a new experience in retail design, Hans Ulrich Obrist. Curation means more than the dictionary intended, now that it is assimilated into context beyond the more common exhibition space scope. Take my words as thoughts unresearched, but for me, a similar trajectory is in the works for poetry, 
poetry defined for now in the very simplistic sense of being at least a literary work. Or take Eileen Miles' word for it. Oh yeah, poetry's exploding right now. I think it's kind of a weirdly hot profession at this moment in time. In contrast to poetry's minor minority readership, the word poetry is being used with increasing frequency. Obviously, there are no statistics at my disposal, but notice how poetry is absorbed into mainstream vocabulary as description rather than noun, as alluring if vague praise. Whereas many shun the literary form as a difficult, even elite genre, it is that same cultured veneer that is sought after and that the adjective poetic projects. Case study. Grey's Anatomy, television series, season 11, episode 13, shows Dr. Amelia Shepard on a stage discussing an astrocytoma brain tumor she is about to surgically remove. Riddled with rhetoric, she accumulates descriptions of the cancer in short, powerful phrases. It's not just about tumor, it's ingenuity, it's strength, it's adaptability, it's poetry. At the climactic iteration, the tumor becomes poetry. The tumorous swelling in the brain is likened to the dramatic swelling of voice mid-recitation. Poetry endows the tumor with the beauty of creativity, a growth that demands respect. Tumorous, timorous, case study. I recently visited the Goodman Gallery in Cape Town, South Africa. The exhibition at the time was entitled The Poetry in Between South-South, immediately intriguing me. It's fashionable to incorporate text into visual art, a wink to graffiti, a coll collaboration of image with a wisdom of quotation. So on my way to the gallery, I expected at least a few artworks inspired by poems of dead guys or road signs and political newspaper headlines repurposed as verse. To my surprise, there was nothing of the kind. In fact, of all the art in the entire gallery, there was absolutely no text or references to text. Poetry had been incorporated into the title of the exhibition as a deliberate dissociation from the verbal. Poetry's not made of words, Ariana Rines. In reaching an audience, the airwaves literally touch a listener as sound enters her ears. Voice. Told to find my voice, I popped out my eyes and swallowed them. My eyes saw nothing so I sliced off my ears and swallowed them. My ears heard no voice, so I swallowed tongue, hands, nose, etc. Still no voice of mine was found, just a rude speaking in someone else's dream. Where the voice goes. Where does the voice go? You ask this question, dear reader, and you are right to ask it. Most justified. Well, what shall I say next? Welcome. Welcome is what I shall next say to you. Welcome, dear reader, to this, the answer to your question. Welcome to the poem entitled, Where the Voice Goes, an answer. How very convenient for you. Um, 
The mic is open. One of the features of publishing a poem, even more so a book, is the altered relationship to the page. While writing, reading, and editing, the poet accustoms herself to the exact layout of print, intimate with the margins, each page breaks expectations. Waves break, but can't break pages. Now, standing with his hard copy, fumbling at the choreography, a hesitation of amplified breathing, opening up every instant, a loss, and opening up, a loss of edges, new edges. As Bernstein argues in Close Listening, Poetry in the Performed Word, quote, readings are the central social activity of poetry. They rival pub publishing as the most significant method of distribution for po poetic works, end quote. Building on Bernstein's position, this essay listens to how radio distributes poetry on air and what happens when that very same medium also becomes a forum for discussing the methods through which poetry is distributed across the nation. Informing this essay is the broader methodolo methodological question of how radio could provide us with a comparative model for thinking through digital archives of poetry. In other words, how does radio and the radio archive ask us to rethink what constitutes an archive of public poetics. I will argue that the radio archive asks us to reimagine the airwaves of radio through and as public poetics. Public poetics as radio, radio poetics. Phono kit. Thomas Edison, trademark, crossed the Atlantic to capture Tennyson's voice on a wax cylinder. This is to be read militantly because the poem was The Charge of the Light Brigade, which itself looks like a wax cylinder, grooves containing sound in the nooks of letters. Of the first ten words in that poem he read, so much like Ezra Pound's fascist broadcast, Europe calling, pound speaking, Ezra Pound speaking, three of the words are half, three of the words are a. Uh, Three of the words are leak, and one of the words onward. Turning in circles, a scratched prison spun for his ghost. Many decades, the cone was lodged behind a steam radiator in a decrepit third floor flat where Kit played his Elf King 45 on a realistic trademark phonograph. I do what I can to keep an even tone of voice. Now, when I drop my voice, they turn on more current. This is still to be read militantly. Discovered by Kit in the spring of 68, what the, like a defeated conch shell, Kit softly returned its shape by his own device, made it utter the deep sounds of bulk many links under, all in the valley of death were the first words he could discern, but all oh, E-O-S, from the throats of ancient male fish, Kit thought. All the world wondered. Reminded of his youth, his effigy parents and their wax substance, all the voices possibly melted into the childhood figures of desire, the coitus dummy's thighs, flashed all the sabers bare. There was nothing he could do but record the impurities as he heard them. Eight seconds of crackling, one second of overload, eight seconds of crackling, Three seconds of mucus sound. Two seconds crackling. 35 seconds horrible high frequency distortion. Eight seconds mouth noises. 19 seconds very dull tapping as in a dream. Four seconds crackling. Two seconds nasal passage. Four seconds crackling. 31 seconds of obscure whispers. Someone had blundered. 
There is no end to this charge of history, but the wax cylinder turning in Kit's decrepit flat, the same martial voice, the same sounds in between words, the repetition of the blunder, the same 600 slaughtered. Like the flight of Lindbergh, all early recording is meant for translucent pedagogy. Body Kit. Plato at his typewriter is the topic of conversation at this conversion party with hors d'oeuvres and friends sitting at your feet. What are you converting to? An honest pupil vainly drinking rye adjusts his posture and wait. From empiricism to idealism, no, I mean the other way around, you reply respectfully. You bastard. I don't know where my cattishness comes from, but once I read Sylvia Plath in an afternoon while I reclined on the bleachers, it was too cold and I was too old to be there. But there is pleasure in imagining myself angry at you, my mentor, idolized by so many fleas in our bed. I have not had an Anglo-Saxon upbringing, and so the tense reticence and the witty afternoons of avoidance are attractive to me. But how do I act when you impress the youth with talk of Plato as his at his typewriter? How do I act watching you tap, 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 reasons on their blank foreheads? Self-restraint is inconceivable, and probably I molest you at first opportunity in the powder room. I like the silent repartee we have, and when I hear you tell them about Plato's typewritten pages of the letter A, which the philosopher spent the last year of his life examining for minute difference, I can feel how I should smile inside, but not feel warm inside. I will be sorry when this jealousy must come to an end, and I will be left alone in an apartment that might have been acceptable for such a life as ours, providing many occasions, such as today's secret drama of hate, for me to despair quietly, a blanket over us. Kit discovers sound. Kit found work in statistics at the University of Peripheral Matter, counting words per sentence for the great canon he chose. The results were startling. In the first 5,000 sentences, 2,455 even, 2,545 odd. In the third 5,000 sentences, 2,462 even, 2,538 odd. In the 40,000 sentences, 20,001 even, 19,999 odd. Spencer used twice as many O's as De Quincey. Swift averaged twice as many complaints per period as Schiller. Chaucer used the least number of simple sounds anywhere. The chancellor of UPM sent a memo of congratulations. On his lunch break, Kit composed nonsense verse about insects. The numbers clicked like beetles in his desk and taught him love was meaningless unless counted over time. He dreamed battalions of smarmy bugs on summer flesh. All that counting, he began to divide his objects into sound. He purchased a hi-fi and imagined sound tattoos by a diamond needle. He baked sound potatoes wrapped in foil and dipped sound wieners into mustard. He purchased a micro recorder and began recording everything edible. Dropped leaks in Chinatown, freeze-dried dragonflies, the sound of stillborn onions. In the hiss of the world, in the hush of the phonograph lady's throat, he heard cuts of living voice and imagined sound tattoos by the tip of a diamond needle. He purchased a micro recorder and began recording everything audible the jumbled names of telephone conversations, the squeak of his own greb steps, the bell struck like an alarm of terror, the rapt crunch of shoulder cartilage, the honk of a city moon, the pivot and scrape, resistance to arrest, the pop and crinkle of tweakies ravaged, the rubber thunk of dead pinball, evenings at home labeling little tapes, the sound of lists piling, the shuffling sound of general unemployment, snow falling general over populations, slap shots thwacking urban plywood, the hiss of cappuccino machines like Madagascar cockroaches, the pling of porcupine quills in a curious poodle's nose, the clip-clop of cleft hooves, 
the O's and Van Torns de Kooning, the hurrah of ardent fervor, the man in apartment 12 scratching a nightmare onto his wall at 4 a.m. like clockwork, hospitals after midnight. What's all this? These are all my sounds. The heraldry of hockey night in Canada, soft paper tearing, cigarette cellophane, wax candle thud, clink, a bullet in a teacup. He hits the goal post. The sound of the old fur district groaning, the muted sound of a hand deep inside, whittling licorice sticks, the quiet hum of autistic storms, the waxy rub of crayon parents, the empty tuk tuk of ignorance, beetles at work and ground moths in autumn. What are all your sounds for? They're for remembering. For remembering what? That your pain is elsewhere. The shift of snow angels recently unbodied, the crack of backgammon bones, a tooth chipped on the lip of a urinal, the indignant pause of national humiliation fabricated, the clinks of a reticent dinner, the whir of lost channels, the frail little squeak of being observed by an enigmatic, the press of violent assimilation, the sad quiet of oblivion to their own doom. But I have no pain. Of course you do. No, I don't. Of course you do. No, I don't. The calming gurgle of life amnesia, the muffled pops of a carnival in the hidden zone, the snuffed embers of an Egyptian kiln, rosaries scattered on linoleum, tap, 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 the fascist metro gnome, radio news storms, crinkling the pages of a thin nerve diary. One way to reach people is to give them records. Everybody has a phonograph. People realize that poetry is not just a matter of simple written art, it's a public art. It's an oral art. Significantly, the words, quote, one way to reach the people is to give them records, end quote, are words spoken on air, on radio, one of the ways to, quote, reach the people, end quote. Seymour Maine and Patrick Lane say of poetry, quote, it's a public art, end quote, thus foregrounding the publicness of poetry itself. These last few words, it's an oral art.
Nevertheless, these eyes are to see through. Beyond the clearing, beyond the shadow of a doubt, the rose is a rose. While you slept, our shadows kept coming together. Muse, verb. Take the grand stasis of the noun and plant it. Let that stillness edge to two into stipule and bud. Now, verse yourself in verb. To muse. Reflect on the potential of moving, running, inhabiting space with limbs, with each lobe of the lady skull, mind, brain, and intelligence. 
I page through art history and feel present, pregnant with knowing these women, my ancestors, a lineage progressing from person to muse to image to theory. Knowing the anonymity of women who lose names, abstracting the portrait's role in posing. Chronically imaged in mediums, modeling in words and works, ontological mythologies of personified force, goddesses targeting disciplines, spreading out oeuvres, infusing them with air. I, you, and we muse. He, she, and it muses, so muse is conjugated into plurals. Muse, noun, each of nine goddesses presiding over the arts. Muse, noun, normally a woman personified as a source of inspiration for someone else's work. Sensational labor, extracting agency from stasis and channeling it through the creative process to tour de, for tour de force. This example speaks for me hormonally, harmony of negotiating chemicals my own body drops through me, accounting for my mind occasionally growing long crowned spikes and other times gracious wisteria tendrils, purple and perfumed in physical delight. Homely can either be the receptacle of residency or the residual judgment of appearance. Chromatic portraits posed for, now reaching out of themselves into experience millennia, centuries, and days ago. Reclining figures, color tentatively pulsating through shade to illumination. Muse, verb, to be absorbed in thought, to reflect in introversion, to say to oneself, Muse verb, to gaze pensively, to transform from the gazed upon to the subject gazing, navigating the pathway from eye to brain, letting out the elective sensation of interiority. I activate my homily, walk through the seminar of my life with legs, abdominals, and arms, taking up space with elegance and mind muscular brain pulsate, pulsing thought to inspiration, self-inspiration. To use yourself for yourself isn't confessional, but emancipation. I muse, verb, when I look at myself, not in the mirror, but in my work, body of work. The deep breathing rationality of the body coursing into making through making poetry energized in thought, a recognizant reflection as athletic and aggressive as ornament. Trouble, Sarah the Models, 1888. 100 years before I was born, a painting existed that looked like a faulty blur, but isn't. It features three nude women and a handful of purple clothes. The art historical imagination enjoys these voyeuristic tableaux vivants, considering that I can't think of a single situation in which three women would just randomly sit around unclothed. I mean, I can think of situations, but they're all in the realm of fetish. Pointillistic skin, is something between shimmering and subcutaneous fat, the fabulous but introverted female edge which resists its definition. We live in a society lacking resilience. I could have sworn trouble has a different meaning than it does. I dilate language. The marbled upper wedge of water, thick and obscure, a thigh, planted petulantly in meaning.
matinee. Is a scarf an installation when you wear it draped around your neck? I lift up the artist's book and the blue dawn of the photograph. The gentle disparity between Deleuzean plea and Gordian knot. The one a gauze mystical sensuality, the other two meanings as one. My eyes can't think anymore. When I answer my cell, a voice tells me to see far into the distance, to strengthen the muscles of my eyes or else. So I lower the fabulous blind called a jalousie, cinematic slit, angled lids of light, grayed with the passing quality of the day inside, lying in wait for, straightened, to take on a pecuniary sense, less lineated, the poetry of slatted light, dazzling, fragmentary perspective. If only the whole day were morning, the minimalism and also the monogamy of the couplet. Desire paths. Writing lines as punishment being something I did perhaps once or twice in elementary school. Never my fault exactly. Class misconduct leading to the equivalent of a group poem with dictated words, repletion of the most boring variety, forbidding or framed as, I will not. Tidiness of handwriting, crucial to the flow of correction, not only to write the words, but to write them with respect. Sensuality isn't supposed to be of the essence before adolescence. Desire paths, also called desire lines, are those that trespass property, shortcuts that erode underfoot to a permanent secret sequestered at the back of the brain and even I forget exist. Paths imprinted in gardens or fields, paths that lead to very definite alcoves. Recess is a secluded place or it is a break, a line break. For a poet, lineation is a strategic locus of phrases to the advantage of the poem's profile. Every line ever written has experienced the exact same emptiness after the caesura. Beginning, middle, end. We walk with our forthright legs away from the confrontation, and the second reading is better anyway. Poets lick their work on stage, uncertain whether to cleanse, heal, or enunciate. Lick as a residual state of violence. Of the orgasms I faked on behalf of the wind like men's hands. The context of flesh thawing ideologically when even the shoulder of the text is green, a puddle of strophes, knotting and writhing. Stick men, without faces, their curved backs betray a longing for substance. Their dainty stick feet float as random marks on a page. The sad spines of parents holding the tiny stick hands of their tiny stick children. Sterile uncles and cousins bearing grievous loads where thread-like arms meet spindly breasts. Returning briefly to the archive as body, this concept holds particular resonance for the institutional body and its archival holdings as a public broadcaster. Keeping in mind the origins of the word archive as archaean, as a home or a dwelling of a public figure, archon, the archival holdings in its main building in Toronto constitute a national home of public broadcasting. To quote a recent motto, 
Canada lives here. Importantly in this motto, it is not one place that the nation lives, rather it lives here. <laughs> thanks again, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to Samuel uh, and Andrew as well for their help with the tech stuff, and for Clara for curating this event. Yeah, yeah. is someone called Naomi here? Okay, so there's like a, f a funny story. I think she left. So someone contacted me, and it was it was going to be perfect because the the reading started with Jason's poem, um, "Nothing Ever Happens at a Poetry Reading," and then someone contacted me asking if she could read a love poem to her partner at the end of our reading, <laughs> and I eventually said yes. It would be like a public declaration of some kind, and something would really be happening at our poetry reading. Um, <laughs> but she left. I think she was here, and then she felt alienated. My thesis is upheld. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>